Collin family, we're back at you again. We are Hebrew Readers Church. I'm your brother Zach Wall. This is your brother Kasafo. We thank everybody for partaking in this feast of Purim, the feast unto Ahia and unto Yahweh Messiah. Uh, we are going into the feast itself and how it was established, so that everybody can gain understanding. And we hope this is a great lesson for the family. And Ahia be praised, brother Kasafo. You got anything before we get started? Yes, um, if you like the PDFs to any of the former lessons or this lesson here today, just send us an email. I will be able to get that over to you. And I hope you all enjoying the feast and I is prospering you all in good works. Praise Ahaya. All right, brother. We ready? All right. We're going into the story of Purim and the book of Esther. One book from the Hebrew text and others from the Greek text that was interpreted in Jerusalem by the Levite back in the days of Ptolemy V. Now, the word Purim, let's get an understanding of that word. It's H6331. The Hebrew letters there is a P, W, and the R. They say it's a primitive root, and it means to crush or break. Now, the actual ancient root word is found in the P and the W. Now, that letter that represents the W actually makes more sounds than the W makes the O and the U sound as well. This root word is actually fa, a, fa. It's still retained in the Yoruba and Igbo language to help understand that the Bantu speak Hebrew. And the meaning varies based on how one pronounces the word, as in any ancient language, just like Zach, while you're in Egypt, you know the difference in, if I say, sa, what does that mean, sa? Sa, like, yeah, like, right? Right. And if I say sa, what does that mean? That means cold. Like, <laughs> so you can see ancient languages, how you say something and your tone and pitch, it changes the meanings. And Hebrew is the same. In Yoruba, the word, just as the Quran speaks of crush or break, the word fa means break, broken, or fa means crack. And then in Igbo, fo means split or break, or o means to break, or owa means to split. These, what they're speaking is actually Hebrew, and we can see it from this root word of the concordances alleged root word because the Bantu people actually are speaking the Hebrew language. And it's evident by the fact that they still have the root words that are found in scriptures in their dialects. Now, the word for the feast, Purim, the Hebrew word is Poro, and it's in 863 and it's from 6331. We went to that 6331 first to see that in the Bantu languages, what is called a primitive root in the concordance is not really a primitive root because the Bantus actually have the ancient root words because they are speaking Hebrew. Now, H6332, the word means a lot as a means of a broken piece. Per, perim. Now, the root words, again, the P and W, the sound is different here. It's it's pu or po. Are still these words are still retained in the Yoruba language. The Yoruba word for lot is upo or opalopo. There's what they're saying is from this root word that we're reading in the Hebrew scriptures. And the Igbos, they they also have this word. The PW is pronounced huo, and it means to go out or go off or leave out, which helps understand why the portions are given out amongst everyone. So even in their languages, we can look at their meanings to understand why this feast is called what it's called to this day. That word is a good word to help understand that the Bantu still speak Hebrew when looking at the root words of the language. And also seeing meanings can change based on how you pronounce things. Like the concordance said in 6332 that it can mean by means of broken pieces. In Bantu, the root letter P, when pronounced in different ways, it can mean pieces as well. Like the Igbo word pe. Pe means small 
or little or even peace. You hear him say mpe or mpe mpe means peace. Mpe kere is a peace. And also in Yoruba, kere means tiny. So just for a little Hebrew word of the day, so to speak, to see that the language is retained among the Bantu speakers. And we go into these types of things more so to help understand that the names Ahaya, Ashre, Ahaya, and Yache, and Ruaka Kwadoshi are actually the pronunciations in the ancient Hebrew language. All right. Hopefully that helps. Now getting into these events of Purim. Let's start in the second year of Cyrus III, according to world history, but in scriptures, he's known as Artaxerxes the Great. In the book of Esther, the, the editions of Esther, and he's also known as Ahasuerus in the book of Esther in the Old Testament. Starting at the editions of Esther, chapter 11, verse 2, in the second year of Artaxerxes the Great. Please, Zachra. In the second year of the reign of Artaxerxes the Great, in the first day of the month, Nisan, Mordokias. It's supposed to be Mordecai. Okay. <laughs> the son of Jairus, the son of Simi, the son of Sisei. It's supposed to be Kish. All right. Of the tribe of Benjamin had a dream. Now, this is where it all started. If we would have only had the book of Esther, we would have never known that Mordecai had a dream before everything transpired. Right. Yet. Through the records, we get understanding. And seeing how Ahaya works, Ahaya showed Mordecai what will come to pass before doing anything according to his word. He said that he reveals things to his prophets before they come to pass. Can you read Amos chapter 3, verse 7, please? Surely Ahaya will do nothing, but he revealeth his secrets unto his servants, the prophets. And here he revealed it unto Mordecai before things came to pass. Now, let's see what this dream was. Can we read the editions of Esther, chapter 11, verse 3 to 12, please? All right. The editions of Esther, chapter 11, verse 3. Who was a Jew and dwelt in the city of Susan, a great man being a servitor in the king's court? He was also one of the captives, which Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, carried from Jerusalem with Jeconias, king of Judea. And this was his dream. Behold, a noise of a tumult with thunder and earthquakes and uproar in the land. And behold, two dragons came forth ready to fight, and their cry was great. And at their cry, all nations were prepared to battle, that they might fight against the righteous people. And lo, a day of darkness and obscurity, tribulation and anguish, affliction and great uproar upon earth. And the whole righteous nation was troubled, fearing their own evils, and were ready to perish. But they cried unto Elohim, and upon their cry, as it were from a little fountain, was made a great flood, even much water. And the light and the sun rose up, and the lowly were exalted, and devoured the glorious. Now, when Mordecai, who had seen this dream, and what Elohim had determined to do, was awake, he bare this dream in mind, and until night, by all means, was desirous to know it. So he knew it, it was something that Lion was going to do, but he didn't understand it. Right. And he was sitting there thinking about it like, what is this about? And we see how these dreams come in similitudes. Now, let's continue to see how things of these dreams came to pass. Going into Esther chapter 1 in the Old Testament, we're going to say Book of Esther for the book in the Old Testament and additions to Esther for books in the Apocrypha for those following along. All right. Book of Esther chapter 1, verse 1, 2, 3, please. Right. Now, it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus. This is Ahasuerus, which reigned from India even unto Ethiopia, over 107 and 20 provinces. That in those days, when the king Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan, the palace, in the third year of his reign, he made a feast unto all his princes and his servants, the power of Persia and Midia, the nobles and princes of the provinces being before him. Now we're a year after Mordecai's dream in the third year of the king. All right, continue to Book of Esther, chapter 1, verse 10 to 12. All right, he's having a feast. Right. 
On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Behemoth, Dipta, Harbona, Dicta, Abitha, Zetar, and Carcass, the seven chamberlains that served in the presence of Ahasuerus the king, to bring Vashti the queen before the king with the crown royal, to show the people and the princess her beauty, when she was fair to look on. But the queen Vashti refused to come at the king's commandment by his chamberlains. Therefore was the king very wroth, and his anger burned in him. All right. So they have an issue there. Jump to chapter 1, verse 16 to 21, please. The book of Esther, chapter 1, verse 16. And Mimikin answered before the king and the princes, Vashti the queen have not done wrong to the king only, but also to all the princes and to all the people that are in all the provinces of the king Ahasuerus. For this deed of the queen shall come abroad unto all women, so that they shall despise their husbands in their eyes, when it shall be reported. The king of Hazaras commanded Vashti the queen to be brought before him, but she came not. Likewise shall the ladies of Persia and Midia say this day unto the king's princes, which have heard of the deed of the queen. Thus shall there arise too much contempt and wrath. If it please the king, let there go a royal commandment for him, and let it be written among the law to the Persians and Medes that it be not altered that Vashti come no more before King Ahasuerus, and let the king give her royal estate unto another that is better than she. Do you see how Ahia is working to bring about his will? Creating this event, and let's see what this event is going to lead to. Book of Esther, chapter 1, verse 20 to 21, please. And when the king's decree, which he shall make, shall be published throughout all his empire for disgrace. All the wives shall give to their husbands honor, both to great and small. And the same pleased the king and his princes, and the king did according to the word of Immucan. All right, let's jump to the next scene of the story in chapter 2, verse 1 to 10, please. Book of Esther, chapter 2, verse 1. After these things, when the wrath of the king Ahasuerus was appeased, he remembered Vashti, and what she had done, and what was decreed against her. Then said the king's servants that ministered unto him, Let there be a fair young virgin sought for the king. And let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom, that they may gather together all the fair young virgins unto Shushan, the palace, to the house of the women, unto the custody of Hegi, the king's chamberlain, keeper of the women, and let their things, and let their things for purification be given them, and let the maiden which pleases the king be queen instead of Ashti, and the thing pleased the king, and he did so. Now in Shushan the palace there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jar, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, of Benjamin, who had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captivity which had been carried away with Jeconiah king of Judah whom Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon had carried away. And he brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother, and the maid was fair and beautiful, when Mordecai, when her father and mother were dead, took her for his own daughter. Uh, that shows some meekness of both of them, because she was very meek to submit herself to the care of her cousin and reverence him as a father. And also, neither of them viewed each other after fornication, though it was lawful for them as cousins to have married. So you can see the meekness people operated with towards one another in these times. Continuing, please. The book of Esther, chapter 2, verse 8. So it came to pass, when the king's commandment and his decree was heard, and when many maidens were gathered together unto Shushan the palace, to the custody of Haggai, that Esther was brought also into the king's house, to the custody of Haggai, keeper of the woman. And the maiden pleased him, and she obtained kindness of him. And he speedily gave her her things for purification, with such things as belonged to her, and seven maidens before meat to be given her, 
out of the king's house. He prefers her and her maids unto the best of the house of the women. You see, Ahaya gave her favor through her meekness. She got favor in the sight of the people. You see how Ahaya was working to use the situation with Vashti to help create this opportunity for Esther here. And let's see where this leads. See what's going to happen from this dream Mordecai had. Continue, please. You're in verse 10. Esther had not showed her people nor her kindred, for Mordecai had charged her that she should not show it. Eventually, let's see why Ahia gave him that wisdom not to tell the people who she was or what nation she was of. Jump to the additions to Esther, chapter 12, verse 1 to 2, please. And Mordecai took his rest in the court with Gabatha and Sarah, the two eunuchs of the king and keepers of the palace. And he had heard their devices and searched out their purposes and learned that they were about to lay hands upon Artaxerxes the king. And so he certified the king of them. How did he let the king know how these things were going on? Can we check the book of Esther, chapter 2, verse 22 and 23? And the thing was known to Mordecai, who told him to Esther the queen. And Esther certified the king thereof in Mordecai's name. And when inquisition was made of the matter, it was found out. Therefore, they were both hanged on a tree, and it was written in the book of the Chronicles before the king. Ah, so it was through Esther he made the king to know. All right, let's continue in the additions to Esther, chapter 12, verse 3 to 6. Then the king examined the two eunuchs, and after that they had confessed it, they were strangled. And the king made a record of these things, and Mordecai also wrote thereof. So the king commanded Mordecai to serve in the court, and for this he rewarded him. Abiad Amen, the son of... Uh, uh, that's, the, that's what the Amadatha... I know, that's the Greek yeah. version. <laughs> <laughs> right. the, the son of Amadatha, the Azagite, <laughs> who was in great honor with the king, sought to molest Mordecai and his people because of the two eunuchs of the king. Now, why does he want to molest Mordecai? What did Mordecai do? And I wonder what Haman was really up to anyway. Hopefully we see what his motives were in due time. Now, Artaxerxes, he had Haman in high regard. Artaxerxes was actually a peaceable man seeking what was best for his kingdom. And Haman played on his ignorance to ill-advise him on what would be best for the land. Let's read the additions to Esther chapter 13, verse 1 and 2. The copy of the letters was this. The great king of the Xerxes writeth these things to the princes and governors that are under him from India unto Ethiopia in the 170 provinces. After that, I became lord over many nations and had dominion over the whole world, not lifted up with presumption of my authority, but carrying myself always with equity and mildness. I purpose to settle my subjects continually in a quiet life and making my kingdom peaceable, and open for passage to the utmost coast, to renew peace, which is desired of all men. Then we see that Artaxerxes he actually had goodwill towards his people. And we can actually see that he really was equitable because he granted Ezra the authority to go back to Jerusalem and teach the law and finish building the temple in his seventh year. Can we read the book of Ezra in the Old Testament? Chapter 7, verse 1, and verse 6 and 8, please. Right. Edra, chapter 7, verse 1. Now, after these things, in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra, the son of Sariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Hilkiah. Continue verse 6 to 8, please. This Edra went up from Babylon, and he was a ready scribe in the law of Moses, which Ahiah Ahim of Israel had given. And the king granted him all his requests according to the hand of Ahiah his Elohim upon him. And there went up some of the children of Israel, and of the priests, and the Levites, and the singers, and the porters, and the Nephthalim, unto Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king. And he came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. There we see, we're getting to see some of the history and seeing the timelines as the books ties together. We had the second year, Mordecai had the dream. The third year, the event happened with Vashti to set up for 
the king to get introduced to Esther. And now we see in the seventh year, the temple, Ezra went to go teach the law and finish the work with the temple. After that time with Ezra in the seventh year of the king, Artaxerxes took counsel with Haman about his kingdom. And we read additions to Esther, chapter 13, verse 3 and 4. The addition to Esther, chapter 13, verse 3. Now, when I asked my counselors how this might be brought to pass, Amen, that excelled in wisdom among us, and with approved for this constant good will and steadfast fidelity, had the honor of the second place in the kingdom, declared unto us, that in all nations throughout the world there were scattered a certain malicious people that had laws contrary to all nations, and continually despised the commandments of kings, so as the uniting of our kingdom honorably intended by us cannot go forward now it's interesting Haman was held in such high regard let's continue to hear more details of these events can you read the book of Esther chapter 3 verse 7 to 10 sure. in the first month which is the month Nisan in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus they cast her that is the lot before Haman from day to day and from month to month the twelfth month, that is the month of Dar. This was in the twelfth year of the reign of Artaxerxes that Haman came with this plot. Book of Esther, chapter 3, verse 8. And Haman said unto King Ahasuerus, There are certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all provinces of thy kingdom, and their laws are diverse from all people. Neither keep they the king's laws, therefore it is not for the king's profit to suffer them. Sadly, he didn't tell the truth. In his wrath, he was led to lie. Continue in the book of Esther, chapter 3, verse 9 to 10. If it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver to the hands of those that have the charge of the business to bring it into the king's treasuries. And the king took his ring from his hand and gave it unto Haman the son of Hamadatha the Agagite, the Jew's enemy. Haman, he unveils his heart. To trust him, which is something that Edom does, sadly. Can you read Jasher chapter 28, verse 20? And Esau was a designing and deceitful man, one who hunted after the hearts of men and embellished them. Now, Haman being an Agagite, Agag is an Amalekite from the book of Samuel. So you can understand that Haman was a, from the children of Esau. And where it says that Esau hunted after the hearts of men and envelged them. The word envelged means to persuade someone to do something by means of deception or flattery. So we're touching on this for our brothers and sisters of the children of Esau to be mindful of this attack against you. This is something for your tribe you have to pay attention to, to avoid. You have to strive to be sincere of heart and honest in all things to overcome through faith in Yanche. Don't seek your own will, but seek what is right in the sight of Allah through his law and the fruits of the spirit to keep you from being designing, deceitful, or indulging people and deceiving people through flatter and deception. We hope this helps for your growth in the faith. All right. We got so far the seventh year, right? He gave clearance for Ezra to go and do what it, Ezra was supposed to do, right? Right. He also took Esther for a wife in that seventh year, according to the book of Esther, chapter 2, verse 16. Right. Haman was there the whole time. Right. So we skip forward to the twelfth year of the reign of Ahaxerxes. Right. And mm -hmm. now Haman's coming up with this plot against the same people that the king had already gave clearance. But he never mm -hmm. said who the people were. Right. And he even proposed to give the king money of his own right. for the ordeal. So you can see how he's in Belgium and what the king delights in. Okay, you're going to help me right. and you're going to also give me money. This sounds like a win-win. <laughs> right. right. He's working it. Let's continue with the book of Esther, chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. Right. And the letters were sent by post into all king's provinces to destroy to kill and to cause to perish all jews both young and old little children and women in one day 
even upon the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar, to take the spoil of them for a prey. The copy of the writing for a commandment to be given in every province was published unto all people, that they should be ready against that day. You can read the book of Esther, chapter 13, verse 1 to 7, to see the contents of the letter. Let's jump to chapter 4 in the book of Esther, verse 1 to 4, please. Right. Uh, the book of Esther, chapter 4, verse 1. When Mordecai perceived all that was done, Mordecai rent his clothes and put on sackcloth with ashes, and went out into the midst of the city and cried with a loud and bitter cry, and came even before the king's gate. But none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every province, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, there was a great mourning among the Jews, and fasting, and weeping, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. So Esther's maids and her chamberlains came and told it her. Then was the queen exceedingly grieved, and she sent raiment to clothe Mordecai, and to take away his sackcloth from him, but he received it not. Let's jump to chapter 4, verse 7 to 17, to see for what reason, please. And Mordecai told him of all that had happened unto him, and of the sum of the money that Haman had proposed to pay the king's treasuries for the Jews to destroy them. Also he gave them the copy of the writing of the decree, which was given at Shushan to destroy them, and to show it unto Esther, and to declare it unto her, and to charge her that she should go unto the king to make supplication unto him and to make requests before him for her people. And Hattach came and told Esther the words of Mordecai. Again Esther spake unto Hattach, and give him commandment unto Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces do know that whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king into the inner court, who is not called, there is a law of his to be put to death. Except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter, that he may live. But I have not been called to come into the king these thirty days. So that's a serious law that they had then. That's a risking of the life, all right? Continue. And they told to Mordecai Esther's words. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Say not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Now that's interesting what Mordecai said because we know the dream he had. And he knew Allah was going to do something. So he wasn't in fear like she would be hurt. He knew like, hey, Something's going to come, and you can see how he's like, hey, you don't know if you were put here for this very reason. Continue in verse 15, 17. Then Esther bade them return Mordecai this answer. Go, gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan, and fast ye for me, and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. And I also, and my maiden will fast likewise. And so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. If I perish, I perish. Then we see her faith. She put it in Allah Hayim's hand. This is where we see the power of prayer. Like, she said, hey, everybody pray for me. Let's fast. And then Allah Hayim's will be done. Now, when we're in danger, as we see Mordecai saw the dangerous situation that we were in, and Queen Esther saw the dangerous situation that we were in, and she in particular, this story is showing the great humility the woman had of old. For those who may not understand, Esther being the queen to King Ahasuerus or Artaxerxes, she was the queen of the world at that time. She, she was the queen of the world, not just one realm. He ruled over 127 provinces, all the known world and places of power or of importance. At that time, he ruled. And there she was, humble, still looking concerned for the well-being of her people, willing to put her own life at risk for the sake of others. Nowadays, if we if we get a couple of bucks, we uh we forget everybody. We forget our own family, our media family. 
Right. Now, here we are in her high estate, and Mordecai, in his position that he's in, they are, we're all in danger. What do we do when we're in danger? Because there's danger to come in our lives as well, as we know the times we're heading into. What do we do? Let's see what the scriptures, the testimonies teach us to do in times of trouble. Can you read the additions to Esther? Chapter 3, verse 8 to 18. Let's see what Mordecai did with this trouble that came. Then Mordecai thought upon all the works of Ahiah and made his prayer unto him. You see what he did? He encouraged himself in faith, thinking upon what Ahiah done of old. There we see for our first example and in our instruction from the scriptures. When in doubt, think upon all the works of Ahiah and make our prayer unto him. So we have to pray in faith without doubting. Let's hear the prayer of the brother. Thanks. O oh Lord, Lord the King Almighty, for the whole world is in thy power. And if thou hast appointed to save Israel, there is no man that can gainsay thee. For thou hast made heaven and earth and all the wondrous things under the heaven. Thou art Lord over all things. And there is no man that can resist thee which art Ahiah. Thou knowest all things. And thou knowest, Lord, that it was neither in contempt nor pride nor any desire of glory that I did not bow down to proud Amen. For I could have been content with good will for the salvation of Israel to kiss the soles of his feet. But I did this, that I might not prefer the glory of man above the glory of Elohim. Neither will I worship any but thee, O Elohim. Neither will I do it in pride. And now, O Lord, Elohim and King, spare thy people. For their eyes are upon us to bring us to naught. Yea, they desire to destroy the inheritance that thou hast been thine from the beginning. Despise not the portion which thou hast delivered out of Egypt for thy own self. Hear my prayer. Be merciful unto thine inheritance. Turn our sorrow into joy, that we may live, O Lord, to praise thy name. And destroy not the mouths of them that praise thee, O Lord. And we see the humility of prayer in Mordecai also setting a good example for us to always look at what's right in the sight of Allah. For those of you that may be new to the story of Esther, there was a time where the king, the people had aggrandized Haman, and everyone was reverencing him, but Mordecai didn't reverence him. And that also helped incite Haman's anger towards Mordecai. And here we see Mordecai wasn't prideful, like he didn't have any love for Haman. It was because he would not worship anyone besides Elohim which helps understand that Haman was actually wanting people to literally worship him. But that we can't do that. That's against the law. So may that be an example for us to look at what's right in the sight of Allah when we're doing things. Now, we hear his prayer to see that the power of prayer in the midst of trials avails much when done earnestly, which is with sincere and intense conviction, which also means seriously. Uh, this is a message of the 13 verse 18. So you can understand that prayer, sincere and serious prayer, avails in our times of need. Please. All Israel, like men, cry most earnestly unto Ahia because their death was before their eyes. The Queen Esther was also faithful in prayer for an example for the sisters of all nations to show that humbling oneself in prayer. And in good works, no matter what one's stature is in society, is pleasing unto Allah. Can you read the additions to Esther chapter 14, verse 1 to 19, please? Queen Esther also, being in fear of death, resorted unto Ahiah, and laid away her glorious apparel, and put on the garments of anguish and mourning. And instead of precious ointments, she covered her head with ashes and dung. And she humbled her body greatly, and all the places of her joy she filled with her torn hair. And she prayed unto Ahiah, Ahiah of Israel, saying, 
O my Lord, thou art our king. Help me, desolate woman, which have no helper but thee. For my danger is in mine hand. For my youth up I have heard in the tribe of my family that thou, O Lord, tookest Israel from among all people, and our fathers from all their predecessors for a perpetual inheritance. And thou hast performed whatsoever thou didst promise them. And now we have sinned before thee. Therefore hast thou given us into the hand of our enemies, because we worship their Elohims. O Lord, thou art righteous. Nevertheless, it satisfieth them not that we are in bitter captivity, for they have stricken hands with their idols. They that will abolish the thing that thou with thy mouth hast ordained, and destroy thy inheritance, and stop the mouth of them that praise thee, and quench the glory of thy house and of thine altar. And open the mouths of the heathen to set forth the praises of their idols, and to magnify a fleshly king forever. O Lord, give not thy scepter unto them that be nothing, and let them not laugh at our fall, but turn their device upon them, and make him an example that hath begun this against us. Remember, O Lord, make thyself known in time of our affliction, and give me boldness, O King of the nations, the Lord of all power. Give me eloquent speech in my mouth before the lion. Turn his heart to hate him that fighteth against us, that there may be an end of him and of all that are like-minded to him. But deliver us with thy hand, and help me that am desolate, and which have no other help but thee. Thou knowest all things, O Lord. Thou knowest that I hate the glory of the unrighteous, and abhor the bed of the uncircumcised, and of all the heathen. Thou knowest my necessity, for I abhor the sign of my high estate, which is upon my head in the days when I show myself, and that I abhor it as a menstruous rag, and that I wear it not when I am private by myself. And that thy handmaid hath not eaten at Amos' table, and that I have not greatly esteemed the king's feast, nor drunk the wine of his drink offerings. Neither had thy hand made any joy since the day that I was brought hither to this present. But in thee, O Lord, Elohim of Abraham, O thou mighty Elohim above all, hear the voice of the forlorn, and deliver us out of the hands of the mischievous, and deliver me out of my fear. Amen. Yeah. There's a few things to learn from Esther here. For parents, we see how important it is to teach our children the works of Ahaya, as Esther recounted Ahaya's works that she was taught from her youth in her supplications, while Mordecai encouraged himself remembering Ahaya's works as well. We also get to see the humility we ought to walk in here in our captivities with the children of Israel, as Esther in verse 6 said, And now we have sinned before thee, Therefore hast thou given us into the hands of our enemies. She took responsibility for the part we played in our captivity, as we are to acknowledge our sins, and that Ahai is righteous for putting us in captivity for worshipping other Elohims and sinning against him, so that through our humility, Ahai will be moved to deliver us according to his covenant. We also see we can learn from Esther's humility in verse 14 to 16, because through 16, because she did not glory in her high estate as queen to deliver her trusting in Ahaya, not glorying in her stature in society, or becoming a respecter of persons to eat things sacrificed to idols, the idols of Haman or the idols of her husband. We also see through her experience that doing what's right gets us grace in the sight of Allah Hayim because the king didn't divorce her for doing what was right in the sight of Allah Hayim. Just by working righteousness, she was queen of the world at that time. Unlike here and today where people have to work evil to get ahead. In the next lesson, we'll see how things play out. What became of Mordecai's dream, the prayers of the people, and the plots of Haman and why he was so upset with Mordecai, Lord willing. 
And if you have anything, Zach, well. Sounds good to me, man. We hope everybody's enjoying their feast day. We hope everybody's getting the edification and the scriptures and everybody just enjoying their loved ones today and that everybody gets to go out and give those portions and, and give those portions to the poor. Uh, just it's, it's great for the for the kids and the family and just you know, just a, a pick me up or for things that's going on in the world. It's a great day. So I right, am good. I right, keep you all and just continue to keep on growing. Keep on growing. So. All right. Tell us.